Hello and welcome to Asia Society and to our program exploring Buddhism, mindfulness in Asia. Today we set out to practice mindfulness through our next installment in our Faith in Art series. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are speaking to you from the Wurundjeri and Bunwurun people of the Kulin Nation. And I would like to welcome and acknowledge any Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander or First Nations people watching our webcast today. As we come into you remotely today, I would like also to acknowledge that many people tuning in may be on the lands of other traditional custodians and I pay respect to those communities wherever they are. We are bringing you today's program in partnership with the National Gallery of Victoria, presenting to you from the galleries displaying the NGV's excellent Asian art collection. From our daily rituals to the art we consume, Buddhist principles and practice pervades more of 21st century living than we might realize. We see it in our multicultural society, in our buildings, in our furniture, in online platforms. Meditation too has become an essential component of a healthy lifestyle, an effective way to manage stress caused by uncertainty or the everyday pressures of modern life. But where did the mindfulness movement originate? What can these symbols teach us about the guiding principles of this ancient religion? Today on Buddha's birthday, we delve into the origins and principles of Buddhism through art and practice. We hope to nourish your mind and cultivate calm through a tour of the NGV's Buddhist works with senior curator of Asian art, Wayne Crothers, an exploration of Buddhism through guided meditation with former monk and a senior lay teacher at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Sandeep Kaki. Learn more about our speakers today by clicking on the description box of this video. Awaken both your body and mind by exploring Buddhist art and practice with us. To start, let's explore the principles of teaching of Buddha a little bit further. Welcome Sandeep and thank you for joining us today. Um, let's start with your own Buddhism story. Um, uh, how did you come to know about Buddhism and what part of Buddhism inspired you okay. to become a monk? Uh, first of all, thank, thank you for having me here. Uh, where Buddhism was concerned, uh, a lady came in. I, I came from a, a Buddhist country uh, where they practice a lot of Tibetan Buddhism. But I was never into any kind of religion before or any kind of mental state where you practice a mental aspect. When I was doing my university in in USA, a lady came and told me I should meditate. Then I went back home to Nepal and I looked for meditation and I couldn't find any way. Uh, after a couple of months, it was just on top of the hill out there. It was called as Goinka Retreat. So I sat there for uh, just 10 days retreat where you're not allowed to talk. Not allowed to look at other people even, but it was very intensive. And it really helped me. It really helped me. After 10 days, it gave me a bit of insight, insight of myself to know who I was and what kind of state of mind I had. And I think that slowly led me to become a monk because being a monk, I could practice more and to see who I was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, to set the context for our listeners and viewers, um, where did Buddhism originate and what are its guiding principles? Ah, uh, okay. Buddhism? Okay, Buddha. Anyone can become a Buddha, that's the first thing you have to understand. Uh, Buddha, before, before Siddhartha Gautam became Buddha, he was born in Nepal. Uh, he was born in a place called as Lumbini. He got enlightened in India, but he preached, not preached, I would say, he practiced and taught other people around that foot belt of Himalayas, and around that area where you can call it that sub-Indian continent, mm -hmm. in that area, yeah. Mm. Great. And um, how do you see Buddhism interact with the culture all around the region? Uh, I think wherever Buddhism went, I think culture got, it went side by side. Because Buddhism did not exclude any kind of cultures. It accepted those cultures. Like if you see Buddhism in Tibet and Buddhism in Thailand, because of the effect of culture, Buddhism has taken a different role. But at the end of the day, the essence of Buddhism or the way they practice is nearly the same. Mm. 
Thank you. Um, what are the fundamental principles of Buddhism? Uh, in Buddhism, uh, I would divide Buddhism in three aspects. The first aspect I would divide it as being generous in life. Uh, the biggest problem that we as a human have is we tend to hold on to everything in life and by giving things in life you tend to become a bit more, you tend to let go, you tend to let go in life and once you start to let go you have some kind of peace within yourself. The second aspect is concentration, uh, bringing the mind to one aspect. If you really sit and watch your state of mind, the mind is running like a wild fire or like a wild horse. So it's good to take a step back and bring the mind towards yourself. Because in day-to-day -day life, what we see is the problem is outside, but in reality, the problem is inside within ourselves. It's a our perception that creates problem. So once you try to cultivate and bring the mind to yourself, the mind becomes calm. And once the mind becomes calm, then the third aspect you can put in is the wisdom. And the wisdom is divided into three aspects. The first aspect is things change in life. Everything changes in life. The second aspect is, because things change in life, there's always suffering, because we want things to be permanent. But in reality, things change in life. And the third aspect is non-self. Like the, what we see right now is a perception. It's not actually me that sees it. So bring Buddhism together, so we divide them in three different aspects. Mm, thank you. Um, meditation is a big part of Buddhist practice. Um, how do you define meditation? What is it? And how do you practice it on a daily basis? Uh, okay, let me talk about practice first. Uh, meditation you can practice in any kind of, uh, in any way or by sitting, by standing, by sleeping, mm. or while you're in a train or while you're driving. Meditation is a is an exercise to your mind. What we do is we're trying to be aware of things that happen. A small example, when, you, when you're on a train or when you're in a tram and someone gives you a bump, if you just look at this person and give him a smile, things change. But if you give him a dirty look, things change again. So meditation is mostly an a exercise to your mind to see who you are and what kind of state of mind do you have. And in daily life, meditation has now become a, a little bit trendy and a lot of people are practicing it. Uh, do you think it's a good thing? Uh, okay, I'll, it's, I think it's good to understand what state of mind you have. Mm. I think it's very important because if you really see your state of mind, I think we'll run away from it. Mm. Because the amount of dirt or amount of defilement we have in the mind. I know uh, it has taken a different step because and I, sometimes I think, have we lost the essence of meditation or have we taken the wrong part? But actually, if you look at it, it's always good to be aware of your state of mind. Mm -hmm. And many people now are using meditation to improve their lifestyle. Is that the sort of the right way of thinking about meditation? Uh, I would see life as a very holistic way. Uh, it's good to have different approaches in life and you could have meditation as one of your approaches in life and I would say meditation does help, it mm. does help in day-to-day mm. -day life. Thank you and how do you use Buddhist principles in your work with other people and with your clients? Uh, <laughs> I work in healthcare so uh, I work with people who've got dementia or, and I work in palliative so Meditation has really helped me because it has helped me to understand who I am. And sometimes I, I work with people who've got dementia and it's what I give them, it's what they reflect. Having a calm state of mind and being with my clients, it helps them to become calm even. Mm. So what I see from my point of view, I think it has really helped me. What are other applications of Buddhist teaching and Buddhist philosophy and practice that you see and apply in modern life? Uh, I think the main essence of Buddhism is, uh, like I said before, the, the three folds. But the other aspects even that help, in, uh, like you can see people who do beads, 
Uh, it's another form of meditation. People do chanting, mm -hmm. another form of meditation. People do walking meditation. It's another form of meditation. Uh, the different aspects where people use to help them. But I think at the end of the day, it's whatever you use, if it, if it benefits you, I think you should use it. Mm -hmm. I guess a final question for me. We are living amidst the global pandemic. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, sort of interpret the global pandemic and its connection with your Buddhist teachings and your Buddhist oh. practice? It's very simple. It'll change. Mm. <laughs> It'll always change. You don't stay here forever. Uh, but I think at this time it's good to have a bit of compassion. Mm. Mm. I think it's given a lot of time for people to think even. Uh, there can be drastic things in life. So in that way, I think what, what it has happened is it has brought a lot of compassion to people. Uh, and it, this, this period of time, there are a lot of people who have been isolated. And I've seen that many people who have used meditation has really helped them mm. to stay within that isolation. Mm. Thank you, Sandeep. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your observation and your experiences with us today. We really appreciate it. And I would like to invite Wayne Crothers, the Senior Curator of Asian Art at the National Gallery of Victoria, to talk about how Buddhism manifests itself in art. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Philip. I'd like to take you on a brief tour of highlights from the NGV Buddhist collection and discuss early stylistic developments and changes that took place during Buddhism's journey out of India and transmigration across China and then arrival in Japan. For the first 500 to 700 years, Buddhist iconography was non-figurative representations and symbols such as the Buddhist wheel of law, the Bohi tree, a pair of his the historical Buddhist footprints, or pagoda shapes that represented a reliquary believed to hold relics of the historical Buddha or relics of an important Buddhist follower or monk. It wasn't until the first and second century AD, approximately six to seven hundred years after the time of the historical Buddha, that the first figurative Buddhist sculptures appeared in two distinctly different styles produced at two different locations. The first we'll look at is the Gandharan style that was produced in the Kingdom of Gandhara, located in the region of present-day northern Pakistan and Afghanistan. This region was the easternmost area reached by the Macedonian conqueror Alexander the Great, who it is thought brought Greco-Roman sculpturing styles from the Mediterranean in the early 4th century BC. Sculpted from locally found dark grey cyst stone, Gandharan Buddhist sculptures have facial features with articulated noses, eyebrows, hairstyles and anatomically pronounced torsos that display strong resemblance to Greek and Roman sculpture. And their flowing robes show strong association to clothing of the Greek and Roman empires. On the other hand, if we view the work behind me here, uh, we'll see distinctly different style of Buddhist figurative iconography that was developed at a similar time in the region of Mathura in central northern India. Mathura sculpture used local pinkish sandstone and was influenced by the soft rounded figures found in Hindu sculpture. Although this example's head is missing, Mathura sculpture displays locally influenced facial features and as we can clearly see in this example, the large twisting belt and lightweight body hugging attire is of a distinct Indian subcontinental appearance that was popular during this era. Mahayana Buddhism gradually transmigrated northwest out of India over the Karakoram Ranges, then eastward along the Silk Road through Central Asia, establishing cave temple grottoes at Dangquan in current day Gansu Province, China, and arrived in central China around the first century AD, establishing the White Horse Temple in Luoyang that still exists to this day. A very good example of Chinese Buddhist sculpture in the NGV collection is the Chinese Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, also known as Guan Yin, the one who hears the sounds of prayers of the world. This male figure has taken on a compassionate androgynous appearance, 
carved from wood. The figure is wearing sumptuous costume of an Indian prince, but portrayed with a distinctly Chinese languid pose, Chinese eyes, Chinese eyebrows, nose, and delicate lips. From China, Buddhism continued its eastward migration via two paths. One northward, then down the Korean Peninsula, and the other to the central Chinese coast. Then both routes crossed to Japan by sea, arriving there at, at their most eastward point during the 6th century AD. I'll now move on to the Japanese gallery where we can look at some examples of Japanese Buddhist art. Here we are in the Japanese gallery, but not unique to Japanese Buddhist sculpture. A common motif in all Buddhist art is the blossoming lotus flower. This wonderful example of a Japanese Buddhist sattva at the entrance to the gallery has a figure standing on a pedestal representing a lotus flower, and the figure is surrounded by a halo of swirling lotuses. In Buddhism, the muddy lotus pond is thought to be like our daily life of mortal existence, and the lotuses represent the true Buddhist nature that can rise through the murky water to the surface of the pond and blossom into the clarity and enlightenment that is represented by the sun and the blue sky. Early Buddhist sculpture produced in Japan followed Chinese conventions that arrived during the 6th century onwards. However, during the 12th century, sculpture took a distinct Japanese appearance. The Amida Buddha behind me is an excellent example of this Japanese style of sculpture. His serene face with gentle features, long arched eyebrows extend into a thin nose, downcast eyes and small lips project an aura of empathy and contemplation. Simple in its appearance, this representation of the historical Buddha is filled with coded attributes. These include the extended lobe on top of his head to accommodate his advanced understanding of the truth, his large ears that allow him to hear all people in need, the folds on his neck that indicate compassion for all people, his tightly curled hair that symbolizes saintliness, wisdom and spiritual awakening, the rose-colored crystal set amongst his hair that emits rays of supreme light and knowledge, and the white crystal on his forehead, which represents a long curl of hair that shows his love, affection for humanity. The Amida Buddha descends from paradise to receive devotees as they are dying. And his hand gestures, or mudra, display one of the nine different gestures that determine the nine possible paths for the dying to enter paradise. The gesture on this sculpture is known as Jobon Getso, and is considered to be the third of nine levels and the most common path for the general practitioners of Pure Land Buddhism in Japan. Another fascinating hand gesture on display in the gallery is found on the central icon of esoteric or Mikkyo Buddhism, the Dainichi Nyurai, or Buddha of the Great Sun. His characteristic hand gesture is the mudra of the six elements, where his index finger of the left hand is representing spiritual consciousness and is clasped by the five fingers of the right hand representing the five worldly elements earth, water, fire, air and space. This unity of mind and nature symbolises the complete spirit of oneness with the universe. The final works I'd like to introduce are two pairs of Zen paintings by two famous Zen monks, Sengai Gibbon, who was active during the late 19th century, and Nakahara Nantembo, active during the early 20th century. Zenga is the Japanese term for gestural monotone ink painting and calligraphy created by artists and monks who use painting as an aid to meditation, as an expression of enlightenment and as the purest form of teaching Zen principles. Often referred to as ink traces, Zenga are produced with vigorous brush strokes and are considered spontaneous transmissions from mind to paper. They result in contemplative images of nature, humorous depictions of Zen life or portrayals of famous Zen figures and are often accompanied by calligraphic messages, poems and conundrums.
The work behind me on my right is by Sengong Gibbon. He's painted the popular Zen duo of the rogue philosophers Kanzan and Jitoku. They are two eccentrics that resided on a mountain in China around the 8th century. Kanzan, shown holding a paper scroll, lived in a cave and wrote poems, while his friend Jitoku, holding a broom, worked in a temple kitchen and collected scraps of food for the pair to eat. The couple are typically portrayed laughing at a Zen joke or conundrum and symbolise simple and enlightened living that is free from petty concerns and social conventions. The two scrolls are inscribed with the poetic observations from two of China's most sacred Buddhist mountains. The painting of Kanzan is inscribed with mist on the branch tips over Mount Tiantai. The painting of Jitoku inscribed with the autumn moon over Mount Eimei. The other pair of scrolls is by Nakahara Nantembo, entitled Procession of Monks. It depicts the morning ritual of Zen monks collecting elms or donations of food, money, and other necessities. The historical Buddha lived a non-materialistic life. Surviving on elms and collecting elms has remained an important part of Japanese Zen practice that reminds monks of the original austere life of the Buddha and allows ordinary people the opportunity to earn merit by making donations. In Nakahara Nantembo's expressively brushed, humorous first scroll, we see a line of monks departing their temple to collect elms, and then in the second scroll, they are returning later in the day. The inscriptions read, trainee monks of the four seas, their bowls resonating like thunder, wearing round straw hats, come and go to transform the village. 83 years old, Nantembo. This inscription alludes to the thunderous recognition of the truth that is the ideal of Zen enlightenment. I will now invite Sandip back to conclude our event with a guided meditation. Please make yourself at ease. Be calm, be relaxed. Uh, we don't need our eyes, so we can close our eyes. Uh, all you have to do is just listen to the instructions. Uh, don't look for anything in the initial state. Just sit down, just sit down and be relaxed. Do not look for anything. If the mind is running, let it run. Just leave the mind aside. Just be calm, just be relaxed. It's always good to have a back straight up. Uh, it does help, it does help. Slowly bring your attention towards your body. If you've got any pain anywhere in your body, just be with it. Just be with it. Just accept the pain as it is, as it is. If you feel uncomfortable anyway, just be with it. Do not try to discard it or throw it away. Just accept it. Just accept it. Slowly bring your mind towards your nostrils. If you can feel anything there, just stay with it. Stay with it. If there's any kind of sensations around your nostrils, just stay with it and be aware of the breath. The breath going in and the breath coming out. Just be aware, be mindful. Just be mindful. If the breath is short, do not try to make the breath long. 
If the breath is heavy, do not try to make it light. Our work for this day is to accept things as they are, to accept the breath as it is. All we have to do is just to accept it. But be with the breath. Be with the breath. Just be with the breath. If the mind is running, bring the mind back to the breath. Bring it back to the breath. Just be aware, be mindful. Just be mindful of the breath. And accept the breath as it is. Just accept it. Just accept it. If you're thinking too much, try to stick with the breath, the whole length of the breath. The whole length of the breath going out and the whole length of the breath coming in. The whole length of the breath coming out, the whole length of the breath coming in. Breath going out, breath coming in. Breath going out, breath coming in. Just be with it, just be mindful. Just be mindful, be aware, just be aware. So we'll do the closing of the meditation. We'll give a short one, uh, which is called as uh, loving and compassion. If you've got any pain in your body, just stretch your legs or stretch around. Make sure you don't have any pain in your body. Because loving and kindness doesn't go along with pain. So if you've got any pain, just, just release it. Just let, you can move your body around, just stretch it a bit. May I be calm and peaceful. May I be calm and peaceful. Slowly, the happiness that you have within yourself, try to radiate, try to give it away. Just try to radiate and just try to tell yourself, may any beings living around me, may they always be happy, always be happy, always be happy, always be happy. And just radiate that energy slowly a bit further away, 
further away, further away, as far as possible. I mean, any kind of beings, any kind of beings, beings with two legs, four legs, or beings that creep, crawl, beings that fly, beings that swim, beings with form or beings without form, may they always be happy, always be happy. May they be calm and peaceful. May they be free, free from all kind of pain, all kind of suffering, all kind of pain. Radiate that energy as far as possible. If I've harmed any beings, if I've harmed any beings verbally, mentally or physically, I would ask for forgiveness. And if there are any beings that have harmed me, I would always forgive them, always forgive them, always forgive them. Radiate that energy as far as possible, as far as possible. And if you have really harmed someone, uh, try to bring that person's face or image next to you and just Tell them that you are sorry. May all beings, all beings in all directions, may you always be happy, always be happy, always be happy. Thank you for your time. Uh, I will just go back and explain to you what this uh, meditation was. Uh, we try to learn the breath as it is. In, real, in reality, what happens is we are training our mind to see things as they are. Like in day-to-day -day life, if something happens in the external world, we bring it back to ourselves and we just train ourselves. This, the problem is not external, the problem is internal. But in other aspects, we train our mind with different situations in life. So that in day-to-day -day life, uh, when those factors come next to us, we tend not to react, not to react. Uh, at the end of the day, I think it's very important to have loving and kindness within yourself. And the important thing is to share that loving and kindness with all beings. Uh, if you see someone on the train, please go and give them a, a big smile. It's always to give. It's always good to give. Uh, giving a smile doesn't cost anything. And I think it's good to share that. Thank you for your time. Thank you.